All right. Welcome in, everyone. You're listening to Bull Central, and I'm joined with me today by very, very special guest who I've been looking forward to having on the show for a while and has been generous enough to take the time out of his day to come on. He's a three-time NBA champion for the Chicago Bulls for that first three-peat. A first-team All-American and a big eight player of the year at the University of Oklahoma, and you know him as one of the best in the business, in my opinion, in the field of broadcasting as the Bulls TV commentator, color commentator, and host of the Give Me the Hot Sauce podcast. He truly is a Chicago legend. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the one and only Stacy King of the show. Stacy, it's great to have you on. I really appreciate you making the time, man. Oh, no problem, man. I'm a big fan. You know, I know, I know sometimes you know people don't think that we pay attention to the blogs and all the stuff that goes on out there all the all the bulls information but i i constantly listen to everybody you know i like to hear what everybody's thinking about the teams uh your opinions um you guys are true fans so uh you guys know your stuff so i'm impressed especially you i've seen some of your videos i, I said earlier in the year i saw one of your videos and i was like wow that's pretty good that's pretty you know pretty good uh take on things so yeah well last last off season i made a, i made a dedicated video specifically for you and adam yeah i, saw that. I really yeah. do think you guys are some of the best commentators yeah, yeah. sometimes i'm i'm forced so I, I i'm currently uh in the bay area i've lived here for the last 10 years and sometimes i'm forced to not see you guys based on certain blackout games you know if they're playing the warriors or the kings they just don't match up man the, the other the other commentators compared to what you guys now uh, for those watching, if you're not already, be sure to follow Stacy on Twitter, uh, Stacy Twenty One King. Be sure to check out and subscribe to his podcast, which I'll leave in the uh, link in the description. Uh, he always has incredible guests on the show, including past and present Bull players, Bulls players. So I highly recommend it. Um, now, Stacy, we'll we'll talk about this Bulls team, uh, touching on this past off season, upcoming off season, as well as the future going into next season, which I know my audience is going to be the most interested in hearing about. But selfishly. I've got Stacey King on. It's not every day that that's going to happen. And this is the first time I've ever had a chance to sit down and meet with someone who got to play alongside with the greatest player of all time, Michael Jordan. And I'm sure you probably get this question all the time and you're probably tired of answering it. But what was it like playing with Michael? I need to know the good and the bad. Uh, it, it was an amazing experience. Um, you know, I, I grew up uh, kind of idolizing MJ when I was in college, you know, I was a big Michael Jordan fan who wasn't at the time, you know, when right. he came in the league, he just, he just, it was like a supernova, you know, they hadn't seen anything like him. And, uh, so all the young kids, you know, like myself and, and other, you know, young kids coming up, we idolized him, you know, cause he made the game, some of the things that he was doing, we had never seen, you know, I mean, you've seen Dr. J do some things and, but you, you didn't see that kind of athleticism. So uh, it was it was really, really captivating to us, you know, as young players, um, watching him and some of the things he did and then having an the opportunity to play with them. You know, I would have never thought in a million years that that would happen, especially with, uh, you know, most teams who get lottery picks are bad teams. You know, you go to a team that is really in need of your service. Um, you know, I got drafted by a team that won 50 games that was on the cusp of, of um, you know, leveling up being a championship level team. They just missed a couple of pieces. They needed a couple of pieces. And it ended up, you know, myself and BJ happened to be those pieces. So, um, you know, playing with them, I mean, listen, it's like you, anything you read, I mean, you saw the last dance, you know. I did. Um, you have to have a strong personality to play with Michael Jordan. Yeah. You have to be mentally tough. Uh, you've got to be able to deal with you know, his, his, um, uh, you know, he, he's hard to play with. I mean, he is honestly, I mean, he, he pushes you, uh, he takes you to another limit. And the thing you, when you listen to that last dance, one of the key things he said is like, you know, he was hard on his, his teammates. He pushed them. And, um, I think he wanted to see who could, who could go into war with him and not run off and hide when the war starts. You know, everybody, everybody tends to be rah, rah, rah when you're winning and you don't have any adversity. But when you run up against those Detroit Pistons, you know, and you're trying to beat them, it's not beating the Atlanta Hawks. It wasn't beating the New York Knicks. It was specifically the Detroit Pistons. He needed soldiers, you know, and, you know, if you weren't a soldier, you wasn't on that team. Yeah. And, you know, I uh, I started watching the Bulls as a kid, like every kid growing up in the 90s, right? You know, the first season I can actually remember was the, the 92 season, the 92 playoffs specifically. And I know I'm dating myself, uh, but I was six years old at the time. Uh, and for a six-year-old watching NBA basketball, you're not really paying attention, right, to all the ins and outs of the game. You're mainly focused on who the star players are and looking up to them and wanting to be like them. So as a kid, you know, the key players 
obviously you're looking at are guys like you know michael jordan scotty pippen Horace grant maybe even bj armstrong because of, he, he looked like a kid so he, he kind of related yeah. to him right uh but for not really understanding the game of basketball at age six i actually remember you specifically and i'm not just saying that because i have you on but it's because whenever you were interviewed you always came across as this like fun happy-go-lucky guy like the fun uncle every kid wants so when <laughs> later on when i was in college when i found out that you were going to be the color commentator for the bulls I thought, oh yeah, Stacy is going to be the perfect fit for this role. And I have to say, you did not disappoint, you know, from the start of that first season. But I have to ask because, you know, what I do now, which is nothing at all like commentating. I'm not an analyst. I'm just a diehard Bulls fan who thought it might be fun to do a YouTube channel because it's a big passion of mine. But it's hard keeping an audience engaged, you know, being articulate enough to where people want to actually listen to you. What has that broadcasting journey been like for you? Was it hard when you first started out to kind of know what to say, when to say it, you know, because it just comes off completely naturally to you because I have to say, even in the down years of the Bulls, when they were rebuilding, you still somehow made it fun to watch, which, like I said, the same cannot be said about some other commentators. Uh, how has it been that whole journey for you going into broadcasting? Well, I mean, you know what, to be honest with you, and when people ask me that kind of question, you know, like, you know, did I just fall into it, you know, um, you know, I went to school for it. That's what I went. That's why I got, you know, I graduated ah, okay. in, in, in uh, journalism. Matter of fact, I wanted to be a print writer. I wanted to write for the newspaper because at that time, during that time, there was no social media. There was no blogging. There was none of that. It was everything was print, newspaper. So in my journalism course, um, you know, I used to write for the, the University of Oklahoma newspaper, which was a lot of fun. And so I thought that's what I wanted to do. Um, another thing that's really helped me out was that I've always played on high profile teams. You know, I've always played I, on my Oklahoma team. Uh, we were one of the best teams in college basketball. We were playing on ESPN, CBS, NBC every week. So I was constantly in front of a camera. I was constantly, I was getting schooling as a basketball player for something that I probably should have been getting schooling for uh, in my in my major. You know, right. I mean, what what better what better way to get practice is being able to get to be able to handle yourself a 19 year old kid to be able to handle himself during an interview. You know, and being able to carry yourself and be able to articulate all the things that you want. And then, you know, uh, playing for the Bulls. I mean, you know, during that, during those championship runs, I mean, those are, we were like rock band. We were like U2, the Beatles, you know. Yeah. Um, everywhere we went, I mean, we were must watch TV. We were must watch C. Um, I mean, coming up to certain, you know, like Utah at 2.30 in the morning, and there's a thousand fans out there waiting for you in the cold, waiting for you right. to get off the bus. You know, playing with Michael Jordan, that's what it's like. I mean, you're in a fishbowl. So you learn how to navigate through that kind of stuff, you know. And then with my personality, you know, I'm a fun guy anyway. I like to crack jokes. I like to I like to rib people. Um, so that's just my personality. Now you throw in the comfortability of being in front of a camera. Right. Uh, with that personality, because if you watch kids nowadays when they get interviewed, they're they're petrified. Yeah. You know, they get nervous. You know, they're like, they're like, for instance, you have a you have a a lady uh, analyst interviewing them, and they call her man. You know, like, yeah, man, we were we were playing yeah. tough, man. And you, I mean, you ever listen to them? You know, they're yeah. really nervous. They're not comfortable doing that. But right. you can go back. You can go back to any of my early interviews with anybody. And you'll see how I carried myself. Go back and look at the draft, you know, uh, the 1989 draft when I was interviewed by Craig Sager and yeah. uh, just how yeah. I carried myself and, and and how I was able to articulate what I, you know, what I was getting myself into, you know, being drafted by the Bulls. So that comfortability of being in front of the camera also helping them, but the personality of being who I am, um, that also kind of makes it too. Because when you, when you, you know, when you listen to me do a game, you know, you, you, it's almost like I'm in your house. It's like if we were at the yeah. bar talking yeah. hoops. I'm, I make you relax. I make you. I make you see the game differently. Um, because I'll, you know, early in my career, you know, I think I was more. You know, everybody got into the nicknames and all that stuff, which is normal because that was no one ever really saw that um, right. at the NBA level. Um, I kind of got it from people I idolized was uh, Dick Vitale. I thought I, I love yeah. Dick Vitale doing my games, and just I would go back home. And I would play it on tape just to, I'm not even watching the game. I could add 40. I could care less if I scored 40. Now <laughs> I just wanted to hear what he had to say. Yeah. And so I remember that feeling of listening to a broadcaster, just kind of grab you and captivate you with his words and his, 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 the way he put phrases together. 
Um, so I kind of emulated him to a certain extent. That's where I kind of got it from with my personality. And then Kevin Harlan, you know, Kevin Harlan is another one of my favorite guys that I listened to because Kevin Harlan, when I got traded to Minnesota um, during the three P, the second three P, mm -hmm. Kevin Harlan was our uh, was our, uh, our broadcast our announcer, play by play guy. Right. And so he was just getting started and no one really knew who Kevin Harlan was. Kevin Harlan was doing all that stuff for us as the Timberwolves that you see him now, you know, on TNT. He's one of the best in the business doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, it's funny you're talking about the nicknames. You know, I caught your interview on the Windy City Breeze and uh, you were talking about how, you know, I, I've, I've got all these nicknames for people and uh, <laughs> they kind of take off and they kind of forget where they originated from. Right. They, you know, they're not yeah. sending you the merch that you need when they kind yeah. of start coming yeah. up with logos and things like that from it. I uh, joked about that, though. I joked about that. I could care less about that stuff. You know what? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I, my, my philosophy is like this. You know, it's fun for the player. And if they can mark it off of it, so be it, um, you know. But when someone asks you where you got it from, you better make sure you say you give me credit. Don't yeah. let somebody from TNT say they came up with it. Jimmy Butler has always gave me credit for the, you know, Jimmy G book at Bucket. Right. He's always gave me credit anywhere he goes. So uh, and it's great to see these guys, you know, prosper, you know, off the court, because that's what it's all about. If you produce on the court, you should be able to prosper off the court. So I'm always encouraging that if you can if you can use it, go ahead, bro. I don't need nothing. I'm just glad you like it. Yeah. I, uh, before I get into some of the Bulls questions, I did want to say something about Adam, actually, because uh, when I heard that Neil Funk was going to be retiring uh, right away, I thought, well, no one is going to be able to replace Neil. Like Neil is an iconic figure. He was really part of my childhood listening into Bulls games all the way back to the 90s when you may not have been able to easily watch and see every game on yeah. TV. You actually had to listen to the radio. So uh, when they brought Adam in full time, I was a little skeptical because, again, I had this Neil bias. But right away from the first game, you know, that he called, you knew, okay, this guy's going to be the perfect fit alongside Stacy And that chemistry yeah. that you guys have been able to build is like none other, the passion that you both have for the game, uh, also the comedic relief that you had. But I'm curious to know, how did you feel when you knew that Neil was going to be retiring? Did you feel a similar sentiment as maybe some of us Bulls fans thinking, well, things aren't going to be the same without Neil? Maybe they're still not, right? But it's different. But Adam has really done a great job yeah. uh, being alongside well you. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, you know, I was really sad that Neil was retiring. Matter of fact, Neil probably held on two more years because of me, um, because uh, I talked him out of retirement. You know, uh, over the last two years of his, his uh, you know, time as the announcer, you know, he wanted to retire two, three years ago. His wife had been getting sick and was having some, you know, illnesses. And so the travel was starting to get to him. So I kind of talked to him. I probably got two or three more years out of Neil, uh, you know, which helped me out because I wasn't ready for him to go. You know, yeah. um, I wasn't, I wasn't because, you know, when you, when you've been with somebody, I was with Neil as the player and then as a broadcaster. So right. I, I have a connection with Neil that spans 30 years. Okay. So, so that means something to me, you know, he's yeah. a friend, he's a mentor. And uh, so when he finally said, Hey, you know, Stacey Slit, you know, boom, boom. And I'm like, I tried to talk him out of it. I said, Hey, just do the home games. Don't do the road games, you know? And, um, you know, and, and so when he stepped away, I honestly thought about stepping away myself. I did. I, I was kind of burnt out at the time. Uh, the Bulls weren't winning. Right. And I just felt like this might be the perfect time for me to ride off like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid <laughs> and ride off into the sunset with Neil. And, and, right. and so, and you know, a lot of times, you know, when the season's over, you're not feeling good about the season because you didn't make the playoffs, you're frustrated right. because... What I tell people all the time, I don't just call games. I have I have I have stuff invested in this team. You know, sure. I play for this team. Yeah. Okay. So so I take it personally. I don't know why I shouldn't, but I take it personally. Like I played, like I made yeah. decisions, or I, I I missed a shot out there. It's just the way I am with this team because I was brought here, you know, as a kid. And I, my pretty much my whole career has been in the Chicago Bulls organization. So I feel like I'm part of that fabric. So sure. when the Bulls don't do well, fans may be upset, fans may be down or whatever, and I'm the same way. You know, I'm upset. You know, I'm disappointed with the way they ended the season. I'm disappointed with the way they played if they didn't have a successful season. I take it personally. Um, so I have to go home and I have to recharge the batteries when the right. season's over. So when you have a when you only win 20 some games, you know, you're coming home and, and, you know, you need to step away from the game a little bit. You need to like refocus on life. You have to recharge the batteries. And so when Neil was talking about retiring, 
you know, after that season, I was just like, man, I should go with him. Because I, at that point, I was upset. At that point, I was down. And then I had some of my closest friends tell me, Stacy, you know what? You know, you say this every year. Like, you, you get, you're so upset. You take it so personally. Take a month off. Don't even talk basketball. And reevaluate. You know, reevaluate. Yeah. And, I, and I think the, the key for me, though, we had 16, I think, 16 different broadcasters that auditioned for uh, Neil's job. Yeah. And um, and that's when Neil was doing the home games. And then, you know, Adam was one of the, one of the first guys. And Adam was the first guy who who's, uh, got to stand in for Neil. And yeah. I could personally tell when I was talking to him that I was like, oh, this dude, this is him. This is the guy right here. You know, yeah. before we even came on air. You know, I've been a fan of, of Adams for a while. I've seen him on ESPN. He does right. a lot of yeah, games. Yeah, he's, he's been a lot of so, stuff. Yeah, so, so I knew about him. I'd never met him before, but I knew about him. And I knew the personality that he had on TV. And I'm like, man, you know, that, that kid's good. He's got a bright future, you know? Uh, because, and you know, in this business, you know, these play-by-play -play guys, they stay 30, 40 years. Yeah. You know, they, you know, you don't, there's not a lot, a big changeover when it comes to those positions. Yeah. You know, guy stays there 35, 40 years. And then, you know, if you're lucky, you know, you come in at the right time when one is leaving, you know, right. and uh, and Adam came in at the right time, you know, right place, right time. And I think his first game was Dallas and we did a road game in Dallas and just talking to him pre-meeting. I was like, man, this dude is this dude is awesome. He knows yeah. his stuff. He, he's well prepared, um, probably one of the most well prepared people I've ever worked with, mm -hmm. you know, and um and then what really sold him to me was the fact that we had a rapport very quickly. Like we, anyway, I'm a hip hop guy. That's the one thing was made me and Neil so our 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 situation so good because Neil's old school and I'm new school. Right. And that was a great that was a great dynamic. You know, Neil likes you know I always joke you know Frank Sinatra and right. Harry Como and all that stuff. And I'm you know I'm 50 Cent. I'm you know, I'm little Dirk. I'm all these these up and coming rappers. I keep my ears to the street, and I'm I consider myself pretty hip. So when we got Adam, Adam was like me. Adam liked the <laughs> same kind of music. He liked the same kind of thing. So that we had a connection there, and then the fact that we could almost like it's really weird. And and our producer Mark, you know, uh, Mark Brady would tell you like we'll be sitting in a meeting, and I'll say something, and before I finish, he will finish my thought for me. And I'll do the same to him. He'll say something. I'll go, I'll, I'll just add on to it. He goes, yeah, I was just getting ready to say that. And then Brady will go, man, that's pretty scary. You guys doing that. That's really, <laughs> you guys haven't been, you guys haven't been together that long to be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it, you know, I was going to say about, about Adam too, is that not saying that Neil wasn't passionate because he was right. But there, there's a different level of excitement that he sort of brings with the play by play commentating. And that's also something you do as well. Right. Which is what makes it so great to, to listen to you guys. We'll obviously miss Neil a great deal. I, I thought it was great that you guys had him back, you know, since he didn't get the yeah, proper. That was a lot of fun. Uh, do this that was really a lot shutdown. Of fun. Having him come in and do the, the play by play for I think it was just one quarter. Uh, that was great. Yeah. I, I loved it. I was glad the, that the organization did that. And, you know, you know, the funny thing is, is that, you know, and I, and I, I tell people this all the time. You know, Neil Funk allowed me to be who I am today. Yeah. If it wasn't for if, if Neil Neil took a backseat to allowing me to have my personality, he allowed me to come. You know, to be the nicknames and all the exciting plays because the play-by-play -play guy normally calls all those plays. You know, calls all those right. spectacular plays, and the analyst fills in. Neil saw that I had a talent. You know, he saw it before he even came on because when he was doing radio and I was with Johnny Red Kerr and Tom Dore. You know, he recognized that from afar and said, you know, when he came over and he said, hey, I'm going <clears> to <throat> I'm not going to change you. I want you to keep doing what you're doing. You know, you got exciting call. You take it. I'll play off you, you know, and for a veteran for a veteran broadcaster who's been in this game 40 plus years to relinquish control of of something that's really rightfully his. That tells yeah. you the kind of person that Neil Funk is. So so I am totally grateful for what Neil did because he allowed me to be who I am today. And who knows? I mean, I still would have I still would have snuck in some exciting plays if he would have taken that more heavier role. But <laughs> um, that's just who I am. Um, but I, I, I would never be who I am now if it wasn't for Neil. And he, he opened yeah. the door for me and allowed me to be myself. So I constantly give him credit uh, whenever I whenever this uh, subject is brought up. Yeah, absolutely. So I got my selfish questions out of the way. 
Let's talk about this Bulls team. Uh, so an up and down season, to say the least. A completely overhauled roster heading into the season. The Bulls right out of the gate. Came out firing, impressing everyone, right? Showing that they're one of the top teams in the East. They established they're relevant again, which for fans was great. Everything's clicking, even despite the injuries. COVID wreaking havoc on the team, but they still remained at the top of the Eastern Conference. And then the All-Star break hit. Things took a turn. The team fell pretty quickly in the standings. And that, that energy, that focus, that excitement kind of fell off where it seemed like no matter what the team did, they just couldn't really string together wins. Of course, you saw a similar outcome in the postseason. Bulls played exceptionally well in the first two games, at least, you know, as it relates to their effort, their tenacity. Uh, but then they followed that up with three blowout losses, embarrassing losses in their own court. I was talking to Sam Smith about this a few days ago, but as Bulls fans, we're trying to figure out and rationalize what happened, what happened with this team. So I'm curious, what's your perspective and rationale for the sudden fall in the season and what can really be learned from it? Because I do think it, there is something to be said that this overall was a positive season, at least, you know, in terms oh, of progress in the right definitely. direction. But yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, you know what? It, it, there's levels to this. Yeah. You know, you, you know, I always use the analogy of baseball. You know, the, ob the objection of baseball, the object of baseball is to get on base any way you can, whether it's a walk, get hit by a pitch or a hit. OK. Yeah. And, you know, there's some people to get up there to try to swing for a home run. And, yeah, they have 30 home runs, but their batting average is like 200 you know, 195, but they got 30 home runs. Okay. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're not, they're not, they're not crossing the plate as many. They're not scoring as many runs because they're striking out swinging for the fences. Right. You know, what the bulls have done with this new front office is they've taken singles. They've hit the ball, got it in play and they got on base. They're advancing their runners. Um, you know, the first domino was bringing in, you know, Billy Donovan, an established coach last year, you know, mm -hmm. bringing him in during the COVID situation. Um, giving him an opportunity to coach some of the younger players, um, you know, drafting of Patrick Williams, which was uh, AK and Mark's first draft pick, which I still think, you know, I know the jury's still out on Patrick, but um, I honestly think he's going to be a star. You know, I, I do. I, I, I got, I'm a big fan of Patrick Williams and what he can bring to the table. Unfortunately, injuries, you know, sidetracked him this year. And that was a big blow for the Bulls because, you know, you, here you are, you're 19, 20 year old stud, that you're counting on to uh, be a stretch four for you uh, goes out like eight games into the season and doesn't come back until the end of the regular season. So um, that hurt him. Definitely. Um, yeah. You go out and get Vooch and in order to get an all-star caliber player, you got to give up somebody, you know, yeah. of course, you know, hindsight's 2020, you know, maybe, you know, maybe people are not up, you know, upset about how Wendell played in Orlando, how he looked very, very good. And it turns out he could have been one of the guys that really could have helped us out this year. You know, and sometimes, you know, like I said, sometimes you got to, you know, you're trying to win now and you got to go out and go get an all star caliber player that's available and you got to give up a young player. Uh, any team's going to do that. And yeah. so you get Vooch and though they missed the playing game last year, which was the first step. You know, that was the first step, the front office. Um, so that's the first step of trying to get to the playoffs. They missed the plan because Zach got COVID and, you know, that's a stretch of games he missed where they easily could have been at least in a playing game had he been healthy. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, you move Lowry marketing, you bring in, you know, you bring in DeMar DeRozan. You, you know, you tried, they made a, a pitch to get Lonzo Ball last year, you mm -hmm. know, couldn't work it out with New Orleans. They end up getting him this summer. You go get Caruso. You add all these pieces that gives you a whole different team than you had the year before. Yep. Okay. And they did it within a year, within six months, seven months, and less than a year. They, they put a whole new team together. Okay. And so that team got off to a great start preseason. They were undefeated. Uh, I think they won like 11 games in a row before they lost their first one. And yeah. I know people at the time were saying, oh, well, yeah, you beat Cleveland in the preseason. <laughs> They're terrible. Well, Cleveland turned out to be a pretty good basketball team. Yeah. OK, um, you know, they, they were better than what people thought, you know, and had they not gotten hurt like we did, you know, maybe they're a different team as well. You know, they mm -hmm. lose they lose their big guy, uh, Jonathan uh, Allen. And, uh, you know, that hurt them, you know, yeah. so. Injuries are part of the game. We know that. But when you lose the players that the Bulls lost, um, Lonzo Ball, you know, you go back and you look at the season Lonzo Ball had in less than 40 games. He's the second leading rebounder from the point guard position yeah. uh, on the Bulls team. That's after Vooch. That's your point guard who's your second yeah. leading rebounder. OK, six foot six can guard anybody on the floor when there's mismatches on pick and rolls. 
You don't have to, if the big guy rolls in on him, you don't have to double because he's such a good defensive player, one-on-one -on -one defensive player. So now your defense is not scrambling to shooters, running around, having to scramble and help your point guard who's getting posted up. But if you have a young player like Io uh, that's getting posted up down there, you got to double because he's still a rookie. He's still inexperienced. And he's going to be a good player for the Bulls, but there is inexperience and it is a mismatch. But when you have yeah. Zoe down there, it's not a mismatch. And you put Caruso and you put Ball when those two guys were on the floor, the Bulls were a top five defense, mm -hmm. top five. Okay, mm -hmm. it it wasn't it wasn't no fluke. They were a top five defense. They were they were they were top in pace, uh, defensive you know defensive rebounding, uh, just every defensive category. They were in the top five. When yeah. all those guys started getting hurt, when Lonzo went out, that was a domino. Uh, then Caruso gets hurt. So your two best defensive players who you don't have to double team, you don't have to worry about them not being able to guard anybody on the floor. They're out the lineup. So now, you know, you you, you got young players playing. Uh, your team's a little bit in disarray. No one's talking about the COVID outbreak that we had here, that we got hit harder than anybody in the league. There was one time, there was one time where, you know, we didn't know we were have enough players to, to play. Like, yeah. literally, like, yeah. I, I thought, me, I thought, I, I mean, I thought me and Bill Winnie was going to have to suit up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so and then and then and then I get COVID. You know, Bill got COVID, so that then the league had to cancel the game. They said, "Well, Stacey King and Bill Winters got COVID. We got to cancel now." So. <laughs> Bill, Bill did too, though, right? I think it was around that. Yeah, same time. yeah Bill everybody, Winters. everybody, think everybody got COVID except Chuck Swirsky. Yeah, <laughs> what does that? What does that tell you? Chuck, Chuck has got a great immune system because he's he the does. only one in there. Every, I mean, I'm talking coaches. No, it, it ran through the whole organization. And then Chuck yeah. Swirsky was like, it was almost like he had garlic around his neck like you do with vampires. He didn't get it. <laughs> um, yeah, let, let's talk about this offseason, though, because you're talking about, you know, the team and, and you know, everything that, that sort of transpired. Obviously, injuries were a big reason for why this team saw the sudden decline. And obviously, I think Lonzo Ball was a huge piece to that. Um, this is a pretty critical offseason for the Bulls. And I say that. Yeah. For two reasons, uh, for a few reasons. One, Zach Levine, you know, your star player, he's going to be an unrestricted free agent. Uh, DeMar DeRozan and Nikola Vucevic, uh, their window where you can win now with them is sort of narrowing, right? And then you've also got the younger players that have a lot of potential and need to focus on developing. And based on what we saw at the end of the season, especially those blowout losses at home in game three and four of the playoffs, you know, you can see there are holes on this roster that need to be addressed because I think we can agree, and I don't care who you're playing, you can't get beaten like that in your home court in the playoffs, especially after you stole home court advantage by winning game two. In your view, what are the most critical things uh, that really need to be addressed this offseason? Well, I mean, of course, number one priority is Zach Levine. Um, you got to get him back in the fold. Uh, yeah. The Bulls, the Bulls want him. They're going to pay him max. Um, you know, you hear all these rumors. I, I mean, I'm hearing people, you know, all these rumors and these people asking me questions about it, you know, Portland, Lakers. Yeah. And, you know, and, I, and the thing I tell people all the time is, I mean, if you're Zach Levine, think about your career so far. OK, you were traded when you got traded here in Chicago. You weren't an all star. You were nowhere close to being an all star. OK, mm -hmm. uh, you were nowhere. You would not even know where on the Olympic team. So all your things that you've accomplished have been in the Chicago Bulls uniform. OK, mm -hmm. Um you have never been to the playoffs in seven, eight years. This was your first year. You just missed them last year. Okay. Yeah. You're building, you're building something special here in Chicago and you're a big part of it. Okay. So why would you, if you're Zach Levine, even entertain leaving when number one, you're going to get max money here. Yeah. You're in a big market for your brand. Chicago is a big city, big market. I mean, think, you didn't see Zach Levine in commercials in Minnesota. No. OK, now now that the Bulls are winning, Zach is doing commercials. You didn't see yeah. Zach in, doing commercials last year when he was arguably one of the best guards in the in the NBA, made the all star team last year. You didn't see him doing commercials, not even locally. And now that the Bulls are winning, he's a big part of it. You see now national commercials, you know, all state or whatever, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mountain Dew. You know, he's yeah. doing Mountain Dew commercials. He's on a national level. And that was all because of one being in a bigger market mm -hmm. and then your team Chicago Bulls which is a global brand a global brand people now are like hey we got to take this team seriously they're winning I mean look DeMar was on GQ when's the last time we had a Bulls player on GQ 
<laughs> Michael Jordan, maybe. I don't know. Exactly. Exactly. Or Derrick Rose, maybe. <laughs> But it's right. been it's been a while since anyone's paid attention to the Chicago Bulls where we yeah. we have not been relevant for the last, you know, seven to 10 years since right. Derek left. OK, right. now we have relevancy back. We are we are now a team to be taken seriously. So if you're Zach Levine, you say, hey, look, I'm going to get the bag to I'm going to get Max. I'm in Chicago where the fans love me and it's a great city for my brand. And we're winning yeah. and I'm going to be an all star. And it's easier to come out the East than it is coming out the West if you decide to go West. I hear these theories, oh, he wants to go play with LeBron. Why go to L.A. when you're going to be the third option? LeBron's going to be number one option until he yeah. retires, okay? Let's yeah. just get that real, okay? Yeah. Number two is Anthony Davis. Yeah. You are the number three option on that team. And if you haven't seen anybody on LeBron's team, um, guys who have been ball-dominant people who are used to getting their own shots, whatever – you have to change your game to fit in with LeBron James. You become a spot up shooter. Now you're not getting the ball and going, you know, 94 feet trying to beat your man off the dribble. That's not happening. If Russell Westbrook can't do it, you think you're going to do it. And Russell Westbrook ain't changed his game at all, but he doesn't fit into what the Lakers are doing. And yeah. LeBron controls everything. LeBron yeah. wants to bring the ball up every single time down the floor. LeBron wants to get everybody where they're supposed to be. And you have to play off LeBron. Now you become the player that you didn't want to be that you were in Minnesota, yeah. a third option, um, a guy who's just, well, if the ball comes your way, yeah, maybe you can shoot it. Whereas in Chicago, you're number one, you're one, a to, to DeMar. You two are the number one options. You're getting 25, 30 shots a game here in Chicago on your team. So yeah. why would you leave to go anywhere else to play with someone else when your role is going to diminishly change going, whether you go to Portland, you're going to be the number two guy with uh, Dame dollar, unless we make a sign and trade with him, which I don't see that happening. So you're going to be the number two option there. Uh, maybe San Antonio where you hear, you know, um, uh, DeJounte. DeJounte Murray, uh, yeah. 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 He's talking about, he wants him there and all that other stuff. Okay. Maybe you're the number one option on that team because yeah. they don't have really a star player. So, but they're not going to win anytime soon. So you put yourself right back in that other situation you were in Minnesota when you weren't winning. Yeah. I mean, you talk about all these teams, all these teams are worse than the bulls, right? So, exactly. so Zach's main focus is winning, which I, I, I believe that it is right. Based on what he talks about, based on the, the, the drive and focus that he has. And then also the money, right? $55 million yes. that he would be leaving on the table. If he wanted to go to another team, that's the benefit that the bulls have and leverage in the situation is they can offer him the most money. So I agree with you hundred percent. You know, the, the Portland one was just, I feel like that's fresh off the press. Everyone's been yeah. talking about that this morning. Um, all of this is, like he said, it just, you know, people trying to create speculation and things like that. At the end of the day, I think he's going to get a max contract. The, the, the one, actually the one I did want to bring up just because I'm curious to get your thoughts. I wasn't going to ask you about this, but since we're talking about the Lakers, I hear a lot of people saying, hey, what if they did a trade, a sign-in trade for Zach Levine and Anthony Davis? First of all, I don't think it would ever happen. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, that's that's interesting. If you if if the the premise was you were going to lose Zach. Right, and, like that. that's the thing. Like yeah, if you, if that, you that, that's Zach, the only way. Going. That's the only way that you ever even think about a sign-in trade with Zach, unless you knew you were going to lose him. OK, right. and and the Lakers only have one guy I would take. I don't want I don't want Russell Westbrook. I don't yeah. want you know, I don't want THT. Those guys are great complimentary players, like if they were throw ins. But I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up an all star and getting non all stars back. I'm just exactly. not because yeah. because, as you know, in this league, it's hard to to build a kid like Zach. It's hard. I mean, listen, we got lucky when Jimmy Butler left, okay? Yep. We got lucky when Derrick Rose got hurt and then he left. Jimmy Butler was able to fill that role as an all-star player, and we mm -hmm. had another all-star. I mean, you know, it's the same thing. We go out. Zach was – was Zach worked hard. Zach is one of the hardest workers in the NBA. Zach really made himself into an all-star player with his work ethic. But it didn't happen um, except here in Chicago. It didn't happen in Minnesota. It happened here. Uh, Two-time All-Star, Olympian. Uh, the success that he's had here, yes, he he has created those opportunities, but the Bulls have also afforded him the opportunity to be that. They've been building around uh, being building around him for the last few years. That's why Vooch was here. That's why they went out and got DeMar to take some pressure off Zach because the year before we got all these guys, Zach had to do everything. Zach had to score, assist. 
uh, rebound. He had to do everything. And yeah. so they they brought people in to take some pressure off him. You got a point guard now that can take some pressure off him, a ball handling, and, and get him easier shots, make him more efficient. You saw the job Chris Paul has done for Devin Booker. You know, Devin Booker was a high-volume shooter, scorer, one of the most dynamic players we have in this game. Um, but his game took a different level once they got a point guard. Yeah. Because he was he was much more efficient scoring. He was getting higher percentage shots. He could score 30 now and not have to work as hard. Mm-hmm. And once it, once he was convinced and saw that, it was a no-brainer. And that's yeah. the same thing. That's the same thing that Zoe brings to this table is that he takes pressure off of DeMar, takes pressure off Zach and Boots, that they have to they have to go out and force things because he can get them easier baskets, transition. You know, there's not a better point guard, I believe, in transition as far as getting the rebound off the glass, one dribble, eyes up the floor, and firing a 90-foot pass for a layup. Very efficient. Very yeah. efficient. So, so if Zach Levine takes 18 shots, and, you know, out of the 18 shots he took, they were, they were shots of catch and shoot, coming off the screen in, in shooting motion. Those are efficient shots, transition baskets. Yeah. When Zach has to, when Zach has to create for himself, which you saw in the second half, that's that's really difficult because his turnovers went up a little bit more because he, he was trying to get in and trying to force things a little bit. Right. Um, it wears him out in the fourth quarter. You don't have that fourth quarter, you know, punch between him and Demar. You know that you can say, okay, Demar, if you got if you got Zoe, you got Demar over here a couple of times. Then we got Zach on this end. You doubled DeMar, now we got over here. Now now Zoe is seeing the whole game and right. recognizing who needs the ball, just like a great quarterback, Tom Brady. You know, Tom Brady spreads the ball all over the field. He doesn't just lock in on one guy to yeah. let your defense load up to that one guy. He spreads it all over the place. That's yeah. what makes him so dangerous. Yeah. Well, not only that, but Lonzo as well is three-point shooting, right? So in case those two guys aren't able to knock down the shots, you can yes. get it out to him. He's one of the best three-point shooters on the Bulls. 40, 40 almost 45% from the three-point yeah. line. Yeah, yeah. Who, who's a player you would like to see on this roster? And, and sorry, a realistic player. Like, of course, we would all love to have Giannis or Joel Embiid on this team. But realistically speaking, going into this offseason, based on the assets the Bulls currently have, the cap space they have available to them, who is a player you'd like to see on this roster, whether through a trade or free agency acquisition? Whoo, man, it's tough because uh, the Bulls only have those mid-level exceptions. Um, right. So to get a guy, a person is going to have to come in here and say, hey, look, I'm willing to take less money to be on a winning team. You know, that they, they got to find those kind of guys that are at that point in their career where they've made their money and they want to win championships. Um, yeah. But 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 it, it's not it's not just one player. It's 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 a combination a of, player. of players. It's, it's a type of player. Yeah. You we, First of all, we need a knockdown shooter. Yep. We need a knockdown shooter. We need yep. a guy like a J.J. Reddick, Kyle Korver, you know, type of guy. Now, we had him in Max Struess. Yeah. And, and we let him go. I mean, we you know, we yeah. had a couple of guys that, that are playing in the playoffs right now. You know, Spencer Dinwiddie. Yeah. You know, imagine if you still had those guys. Yep. Campaign. You know, yeah, can't. Well, I mean, I don't think I think I don't think anybody would have thought campaign is no, going to be. No, the way he is absolutely not. Home. Yeah. So that was, you know, a Doug McDermott. You know, sometimes, yeah. sometimes, sometimes organizations, and it's not just the Bulls, but sometimes organizations get impatient. Yeah. Wait for them, or they're not developing as fast or quick enough, and they give up on them. You know, yeah. especially guys who've only played one or two years of college. Mm-hmm. You know, when you only been you're coming in here as an 18, 19 year old. You know. There's something to be said about the maturity level. You know, mm-hmm. you could have the skill, the athleticism, but the mental part of the game, they don't have yet. And it may take, I mean, think about this. When to get insurance, to get a good rate on insurance, a, a male driver like my kids, for instance, <laughs> you know, they, they, they don't get good rates till they turn 25. Because that's what the insurance company looks at that person, at, at your yeah. son and saying, this is when we think he reaches maturity level right. at 25. Right. So your insurance is going to be high until he turns 25. So you have to almost have that same approach when you're, you're developing these kids. It's like, okay, maybe, maybe he doesn't develop till he's 25. Cause I mean, you look at all these guys I just named, they all develop later. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, you just got to, you know, I think, it, but you got to remember AK and those guys weren't here for that. So they, I, I'm sure it might've been different had they been here, you know, but like a guy like Duncan Robinson yeah. from Miami, he's not playing right now. But his his contract is so big. They just gave him like ninety million dollars, and he's not even playing now. 
you know, and that, that, that hurts because he would be a guy, he doesn't play good defense. Um, but he's a guy that is a deadly three point shooter that yeah. can really help, help this team. And I think, and I think he, listen, I don't need him to be a lockdown defender. What I need to do is I need him to do is be, be aggressive. You know, if, if Steph Curry is not the best defensive player, but he's one of the best shooters in the game, mm-hmm. but Steph Curry does a great job of positioning himself defensively. Golden state does a good job of hiding him defensively, not letting him get picked on defensively. Right. Um, right. And, 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 and I mean, we had Kyle Corver, Kyle Corver is not a great defensive player, mm-hmm. Kyle, but tips would tell Kyle Corver is just stay between you and your man between the rim and your man. Don't let him beat yeah. you off the dribble. Yeah. And if he beats you off the dribble, make sure you send him the help. And that's what you do. And I mean, I play with Craig Hodges. Craig Hodges is one of the best three-point shooters in the history of the game. Mm-hmm. Craig Hodges, we used to call Craig Hodges uh, <laughs> Highway 14 because he, he, he was like, when you're on his, like, it was like the Autobahn. Guys would just <laughs> blow right by him. And yeah. so, so, but Craig Hodges, we all knew Craig wasn't a lockdown defender. So the other four guys, we covered up for him. We didn't allow him to get put on the island by himself and get beat. We were always pushing him to help. We double if we had to run the ball off the guy or whatever, get the ball out of his guy's hands. There's ways you can you can incorporate a, a guy who may not be your best defensive player. And that's one of the reasons why Duncan Robinson is not playing right now in Miami, because Miami has more players at his position that can do what he can do yeah. and do it better defensively. Yeah, I mean, Duncan Robinson, it's a prime example of – shooting in this league can pay you a premium right he's on this uh, massive contract just purely because he's a knockdown shooter um you know i think the the other thing as it relates to you know what else this bulls team needs is uh rim protection um yes. i think that, that they definitely need a rim protector um one of the guys i really was hoping that the bulls were going to keep was tice i knew that it was probably unlikely given uh, the amount of money that he was going to get but Boy, would he have been a perfect fit uh, for this roster? Well, I mean, you know, of course, you know, I think, you know, their thinking was they they wanted to go in a different direction. They'd love to have him, you know, but with the way things were, um, you know, you had Lowry, you're going to have to move Lowry. Uh, you you needed a you needed a wing player like DeMar DeRozan that could get to the foul line late in games, take some pressure off Zach, another wing score, because we didn't have that, you know, um, you know, when Tice was here. You know, um, but Tice, Tice would have been great. You know, if they could have figured a way to keep him, you know, ball, you see Boston went back and got him, you know, yeah. uh, that's how much, that's how much they love yeah. the guy. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you, you, you know, one of the guys I thought they should have went after and maybe they can still do it later on uh, this summer. If uh, it's Cleveland and Cle- the kid in Cleveland, Moses Brown, the seven mm-hmm. footer, he's like seven, one, seven, two. He's a, he's already defensively, a very, very good rim protector. He's very raw offensively, but he runs the floor. He finishes at the rim, kind of like Clint Capella type player. Mm-hmm. Um, but the main thing he does really well right now that, I mean, just for me watching his games and like he, when he was in Oklahoma city, Oklahoma city does a great job of drafting. Yeah. See people, people think, Oh, you know, they're, you know, they got all these young players and they do a great job. Their player development is, is top notch. They, they are. They're one of the best player developments in the NBA. Um, and they're taking their lumps right now because they got so many young players. You know, they got rid of all their veteran players. It's a small market city. Um, but you got to give their front office a lot of credit when it comes to drafting players. You know, they got they're kind of like San Antonio used to be back in the day where they always find these steals in a draft. You're like, man, how did they get that guy? Where did they find, you know, picking up Tony Parker in the second round? Come on. Amanu Ginobili in the second round. Like, right. You had to figure, like, are they the only ones that knew them about yeah. these guys? I mean, right. come on. You know, so Oklahoma City's kind of taken over that that thing, and they've got first round picks for the next, whew, man, the next like five or six years. I mean, they're yeah, gonna they're, they're, gonna be they're able stacking to those draft picks. Yeah, they're stacking them. They're stacking them. And so, but uh, Moses Brown played in Oklahoma City, and he gave us uh, the year that we had the COVID um, situation. I mean, I think he had like fourteen or fifteen points, twelve rebounds, like four blocks. I was highly impressed with him. I was like, man, this is a good young player. Then he got released for 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 uh, cap purposes. They went and signed a veteran player or something, or he got traded somewhere. I don't remember where he got traded to, but he wasn't playing. And then he got released because yeah, they signed the someone Sixers else. The Sixers or I don't Tony know. Who, no, not Tony Bradley. It was it was Moses Brown. Oh, Moses Brown. And yeah, yeah. Moses Brown. I don't know where he was at, but something happened where. 
uh, he got released. They brought in a veteran player and he got released open. And we, you know, I was like, okay, this is a guy we can get because sometimes you have to develop the players that you need. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you have to take, take it on the chin while they develop, but you see that he has potential to be something, you know, bigger than what he is right now. And in eight, K, I give AK and those guys credit. They they see talent. They know talent, you know. So, but so for some reason he slipped through the cracks. Ended up going to Cleveland. Yeah, he had some good games in Cleveland. Had some really good games. When Jared Allen was out, he came in, started in place, and had some double doubles. He had a week where he was averaging double doubles. Uh, they had a kid in Phoenix that was um, uh, a former first round pick who ended up getting traded to uh, Indiana, mm-hmm. and. Uh, uh, and he, I, I don't know his name right now. It's got, it's kind of slipped my head, but he was another kid, six eleven, shot blocker. He could shoot some threes too. Uh, very athletic, just couldn't find playing time in, you know, in Phoenix. Cause he was young yeah. and Phoenix is trying to win. Now they got their core group of guys. If you don't fit in that core, you know, but there was a stretch of games where like JaVale McGee was out, Sarge was out and this kid came in and played and put up some very good numbers. So, um, but he started, he was playing, he's playing in Indiana and he's playing a lot. And, uh, those are two young kids that I thought I would have loved to see in the bulls uniform, especially with the young talent that we already have. Now you're set for your future. Now, when you go into the draft, you can draft something totally different. Right. So, uh, you know, I say, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I just, oh, I'm good. I'm good. No rush. No, I wanted to, you know, uh, and on this question, really, and uh, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but there's sort of the sentiment across the Bulls community that the Bulls, based on all the aggressive moves they've made this past offseason, as well as the trade for Vucevic, last season's deadline, giving up all the draft picks, et cetera, that the Bulls are in win now mode and that that window to win now is closing. And, you know, why it's this upcoming season is just so critical for them and why they need to get things right in the offseason. Uh, so I wanted to know, do you you know, agree with this viewpoint. You've been around the league for a very long time, both playing in it as well as in broadcasting. So you know what it takes to win and how championship teams, you know, they're not just built overnight. Are we just becoming impatient and wanting to see this team win now and not understanding that it's a long process coming? Well, you got to remember this. This is why I try to tell Bulls fans uh, to put things in perspective. Okay. When you, when people say, oh, the Bulls are in a win now mode. Okay. You got to remember it was seven years since they've been to the playoffs. Yeah. Seven years. Okay. So it's time to win now. So if you put that in perspective, you know, not winning any games, you know, winning 22, 23 games in a season, seven years, that was the last time you've been to the playoffs. Why wouldn't the new regime say, why can't we win now? It's seven years. Are we going to go another seven years before we win again? So 14 years of being, you know, bad basketball, no one in their right mind, especially good people that know the game like AK Mark and JJ Polk, they're not going to sit around and wait for another 10 years to try to grow and develop through the draft. I mean, listen, you got Kobe white. Uh, that wasn't their draft pick. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got, you got, you know, Patrick Williams, you know, you got some, I mean, Lonzo ball is still young. Uh, yeah. Caruso's young, you know, when they kept, when they look at our team and talk about old roster, <laughs> I mean, DeMar DeRozan, in my opinion, still has got five strong years left of yeah. playing. Well, does he, does he play like he did last year? I don't know. I, I I'm not, but from what you've seen these older players do, uh, with his game, you know, the way, it, the way he's played, you know, he's a mid range monster. That yeah. game's going to, that, that game's still going to be great. Cause he's still going to be able to get his shot off anytime he wants to for the mid range. Um, would you like to add a three? Yeah. I think he's going to add a three this summer because he probably realized in this Milwaukee series is it was, you know, they sent three or four guys at him, yeah. you know? So I, I got to extend my range a little bit more confidence taking that shot. So I think he'll be, I think he'll be uh, take more threes next year. Yeah. Zach is still, Zach is a young player. Yeah. Uh, Vooch, Vooch is, Vooch is not an old guy. You know, Vooch and, Vooch and uh, DeMar, I think, 31 years old. So those are your two elder statesmen. Guys, you're not talking about guys who've been in this league, you know, that are 38. You know, this is still – It's not the Lakers. Yeah, exactly. It's still a relatively young team, and the core pieces that are here are, you know, 20 – you know, Patrick Williams, 20 years old. You know, Kobe White, 22. Io, 23 years old. These, your, your core pieces are still young. So, yeah. yeah, they're in a win. I mean, why, why not want to win now? I mean – I know Chicago fans, you know, listen, they had to fire the guard pack sign. That shows you how impatient somebody was for someone to go buy a billboard and put that up there. And then they had all these, you know, but listen, and I, and I always tell people this, 
you know, you can say what you want about John Paxson. John Paxson put the pieces in place for this organization after the Bulls, you know, Michael and Jordan and then retired. You know, Jerry Krause went through that six or seven years of losing with, yeah. with Tim Floyd. And then to lose your second round, second pick in the draft, Jay Williams to Jay a Williams. career ending. In, I mean, that would have set a franchise back 10 years. Yeah. Pax comes Pax comes in here. You look at the home runs that he was hitting with players. You know, mm -hmm. you had uh, Kirk Heinrich, Ben Gordon, Lou Alday. These are these, and Joe King Noah. Joe King Noah. These yeah. are these are foundational players that played 10 or more years in mm -hmm. your in your organization that turned the whole, you know, the, the whole organization around with their hard work, their dedication. Then you luck in to get very lucky, slimmest chances to get the number one pick in the draft. You get Derrick Rose, Chicago yeah. home. Derrick Rose doesn't get hurt. No telling what the Bulls are doing right now. Yeah. It yeah. could be a totally different team. You draft Jimmy Butler at the end of the first round. Most people had him as a second round pick at best. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe un undrafted free agent. Okay. They pick him. Taj Gibson in the second round. You draft James Johnson. Okay. Just like any other organization, they have misses. You know, Marquise right. Teague was was a miss. Yeah, you could have got Teague, Draymond. Yeah. You could have got Draymond Green. I think came mm -hmm. after him. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, 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 every organization has misses. The difference is, is that like you can't be afraid to say, "Hey, look, we we messed up on this, and we got to move this guy." That's what made Jerry West so great. Jerry West was always he could recognize after the first year that if he made a mistake, I, I got to get rid of you. You know, and so that's what I think organizations sometimes they fall in love with guys uh, that they draft. They want to make it work. They want to make it work. You have to you have to stand on your two feet and say, hey, look, you know what? We made a mistake. And I think, right. you know, with the new with the new regime, the new regime, they're not afraid to say we made a mistake because, listen, to give up Lowry marketing, you know, Lowry marketing, and Wendell Carter Jr., those guys were lottery picks. Yeah. You know, Chris Dunn, you know, Chris Dunn in that trade with Jimmy Butler. If you would have told Bulls Bulls Nation that we were going to get an all-star back when we didn't even know we had all, we wanted towns and, and Wiggins in that draft yeah. pick in that trade. Yeah. And the that wasn't Timberwolves, it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. So they said, Hey, you take Zach Levine who was had an ACL injury. Remember we got Zach coming off an ACL injury. So mm -hmm. right then and there bulls nation is like, well, we lost Derek Rose an ACL injury. Now we get a guy who's already got one. What is he going to do here? And that kid developed as an all-star caliber player here, a top player in this league. No matter where you put him, you'll hear different people say, is he a top 10 player? Some people wouldn't put him there, okay? But is he a top 20, 25 player in this league? Definitely. Sure. Definitely a top yeah. 25 player. So uh, they got some, They got an all-star back, giving up an all-star. And if you look at Jimmy, and I love Jimmy. Jimmy's been to three different places since he left here. And everywhere Jimmy's been, there's always been some kind of controversy. Um, yeah, so, yeah. so, so when all the people blame the Bulls and, we're, you know, it was the Bulls' fault, and it is Jimmy. Now you're starting to see that, hey, the Bulls were on top of this. They saw this coming that was coming that these other teams didn't see. And right. so you were able to get Lowry, who I still think Lowry's going to be a very good player in this league. I, I think, I think, you know, Chris Dunn, I always said if Chris Dunn would have accepted his role. And, and just said, hey, look, I'm going to be like a Marcus Smart type player. Mm -hmm. He could have been a Marcus Smart type player, kid that plays defense full court, that's nasty, plays bigger than he is. Uh, he's not going to, you know, he's not going to score, you know, 100 points for you, but he's going to give you the intangibles that Marcus Smart yeah. gives you. And look at Marcus Smart now, defensive player of the year. They were getting ready to trade Marcus Smart before the season started. I know, I remember. They were there. I mean, so, so, so what does that tell you? They were ready to get yeah. rid of him. And they yeah. said, wait a minute, you know what? Let's keep him. Let's see how he plays. And let's see if he, you know, does he respond to a new coach, which he did. Now he's defensive player of the year. They look like geniuses now keeping him. So Chris Dunn's out the league. I think, I think he was on Atlanta's team or someone's, but he's not the same Chris Dunn because a lot of times in this league, you know, everybody wants to be a star. Yeah. Everybody wants to be the man. Okay. And it's funny. Michael Jordan is the man regardless. He doesn't care if he hits the game winning shot or he misses 20 game winning shots. He's going to take that. He's going to take that responsibility on my fault. I'm not going to blame my teammates because I'm the one that took the shot. Yeah. So he's willing to take that. But there's a lot of guys in this league that don't want to take that responsibility. They want to take that responsibility when they hit the game with a shot. And they and they were the reason why they won. But when they're the reason why they lost, 
or they're the reason why they didn't hit that shot. They were one for 10 behind a three point line and you're taking a three and you don't want that responsibility. You want to pass it to your teammates. Well, we didn't play good defense or we didn't do this. The great players take the onus on themselves and say it was my fault because they want to be in that position. That's what being the man is all about. You want to be the man, be the man 100% of the time, not 50%. Yeah. Yeah. So really the, the theme here is, Patience, right? I think as as Bulls fans, we've always just been so impatient because it's been so long since we've seen a title come back to this. But listen, you you, you go from winning 20 some games to 40 plus games. You had opportunity to win 50. If this roster doesn't get hurt, Bulls win 50 plus easily. Okay. They're not a six seed. They may be a top three seed now. Okay. Uh, Before all injuries, they were number one half the season, 60% of the season. They were number one team after all star break. You know, he came back and whatever happened, happened. Um, you know, they've got to, they've got to, they got to, you know, look at themselves too in the summer and, and find out what happened. You know, why did we, you know, why did we take such a big nosedive? Because it's easy. Injuries and all that is low hanging fruit. You know, yeah. we can sit there and make excuses all day long. The Bulls weren't the only team that went through COVID protocol. The, 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 the Bulls weren't the only team that had injuries. Okay. Uh, Milwaukee loses Chris Middleton mm-hmm. uh, in game, you know, game two. We're up now one to one coming back to Chicago. That right there should say, Woo, let's kick it in. Let's go ahead yeah. and eliminate the world champions. They that world champion team came back with some resolve and yeah. said, you know what? You know, we're we're desperate now. We got to win. We got a hungry team over here playing us that played us totally different in this playoff first two games of Pulse, and they played us in the in the regular season. We are we're in a we're in a series now. Yeah. We come we come back home and we look like the team that ended the regular season. Right. I wish we could. I wish we could have played all seven games in Milwaukee. Yeah, we we look we, like the team that <laughs> lost a key player, not not the Bucks. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So I mean, that's what champions do, though, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, championship teams. You know, they they you know you've been there, done it. You know, you know how to win. You know how to play tough games. But like you know, the Bulls. That's something they're going to have to learn. That's why I said there's levels to this. You know, listen. You got to bleed. You got to cry. You know, you got to take adversity uh, and you got to bounce back from it. You got to figure out how to keep climbing up the mountain and not get knocked off. And if you do get knocked off, get back on. Yeah. Well, Stacy, I really cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your day to meet with me for meeting with everyday Bulls fans. It really says a lot about your character and how much you care about the fans. Uh, keep up the great work on the broadcast. I think I can speak for all of Bulls Nation that we love listening to you guys and we look forward to you calling games next season. I appreciate it, Jamal. I mean, hey, you keep doing what you're doing. I'm a man of the people. I I, I, I watch you guys, and I, I watch you, and I watch all these guys. And, you know, and like I said, I just did the, the Windy City Breeze. And, yeah. you know, I'm a big fan of uh, Pat's, Pat the Designer, when he does his little uh, broadcast games and stuff on YouTube. I think yeah. that's pretty cool. I'm yeah. like, man, that's that's something when, when, you know, if we're in the playoff game in the second round and we can't do the game, that's something I would like to do. Right. Like, you know, the yeah. YouTube, you know, do a, do a YouTube live stream. I like it. Yeah, exactly. That, that'd that be pretty cool, man. So yeah. you guys are you guys are doing a great job, man. Keep doing what you do. I'm a big fan. And like I said, I'm a big fan. I appreciate that shout out you gave me and uh, Adam last year. That was uh, world class, bro. No problem, man. Yeah. And everyone, make sure you're checking out Stacey's Give Me the Hot Sauce podcast. I'm sure most of you are already. Like I said, it's really great stuff. I love the guests that you have on. Keep that up as well. I'll be definitely tuning in. So thanks, Stacey. Really appreciate that. Enjoy the off season. Hope you're able to enjoy some time off as well. I'm going to try, buddy. Take it easy. All right. All right. Take care.